I think that's a very good idea. I mean, I think one of the purposes I had in writing The Bond was rewriting our scientific story because our scientific story is one that really, as I say in the book, marches us toward atomization, toward pulling further and further apart from each other and apart from things. We have the definition of, of the universe as made up of individual things. That came to us 300 plus years ago with the discoveries of Isaac Newton. Then we have the Darwinian myth of life is a struggle to survive and that there is really not enough out there. And so one has to, you know, life is a race to the finish line. So that's become our real modern myth is life is a race to the finish line because that's really inherent in everything that we do, competition. So for me, the myth, the rewriting of the story is all about understanding that actually the drive isn't to competition, the drive is always to wholeness. And that understanding that, understanding that we've been designed not to compete, but to be share, to share, care, and be fair. If we understand that, that we've been designed to do that, not to beat out the other guy, and that we, we are weak when we compete, we are strong when we work together, we're strong when we connect, because that's what our nature is. We're not acting against nature as we are when we compete. So I would hope that some of those ideas would start filtering down to um, to become a bit of you know of, of the kind of perceived wisdom the common knowledge that people understand because if they do that then that kind of transcends religion because you know even with religion there are commonalities you know there is the common bond between you know there's a, a uh, there was a a, a, a paper that uh, I think the Muslims wrote to the Christians that was called a common bond between or a common word between uh, me and you. And it was basically saying that despite our differences, we share one two big things, love of God and a desire to love one's neighbor. And so there are those commonalities that occur above individual differences. And if we can understand that, plus the drive to wholeness, then we have then we have a, a real sense of the importance of the superorganism and the importance of maintaining that. And then it changes, it makes up for a whole different mindset, I hope. Well, one thing for sure, it has, because I do believe that we were born to belong, like you say in your book, but so far we've been belonging to all these small individual groups, but technology and communications are putting us face to face and that's causing some of the conflict, but it's also going to be the solution to the problem, ultimately. And I think as we can just start embracing this idea of bonding and recognizing that there is, again, we, we don't have the language sometimes to explain, but there is this other etheric field that permeates us. But explaining it is a little bit like asking a fish to explain what it feels like to be wet. You know, and th for me, this is where meditation comes in. When, when I go into a deep meditation into no mind and totally release from my ego personality and who I think I am, I find myself being taken out of this ocean of wetness. And then I can look back and I can see, oh, that's what it feels like to be wet because this is what it feels like to be dry. And when I come back into this consciousness, I come back in in such a way that I can say, ah, this is what it feels like to feel so separate and so uh, particulate man matter, you know, just like everything's divided and broken up. But with a slightly elevated consciousness, that starts to break down and you start seeing that there are no clearly defined lines between us. And I think that ultimately it's going to be a rise in consciousness that's not only going to be the solution to our problems, but it's going to be the only way that we can stop participating in some of these old paradigms like wars and all the devastation that we're doing to the planet. We, we won't be able to. It won't be a matter of morals or right or wrong. It'll be a matter of I cannot do that. In, in other words, like 
I can hold my breath for a while, but something in me rises up and forces me to breathe. I cannot suffocate myself. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that, that's my nature, fighting mm -hmm. to survive. But I think we have a spiritual nature also fighting to survive. And as it becomes conscious through us, we will not be able to do some of the things that we have sit back and said, well, should I do this or shouldn't I do it? It won't even be a choice anymore. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm -hmm. this, is, this is where I, I know I was reading Schopenhauer once, and one of his dilemmas was, how is it that a person can go out and kill thousands of people and turn around and go home and give his life to save one person? And, and I think that this is a, a shift in conscious awareness within us. We get caught up with the struggle and the survival of life, and we buy into all these systems. We can do most anything that we can rationalize out. But in that moment of internal awareness, it, it goes beyond choice. That, that person that gave his life to save a life, right after he got through killing thousands of people, didn't say to himself, well, should I give my life? It just happened. And I, I remember watching Oprah once. There was a police officer that pulled up right behind a guy as he was starting to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. And just as he was jumping, the officer grabbed him and, and had a hold of his ankle and was being pulled over and would have been pulled over with the guy had another officer not pulled up and grabbed that officer and pulled him back. And Oprah asked him, she said, what is it that made you grab hold even even though you knew you were going to die with that person? He says, I don't know. I could not let go. And I think that that's what's going to happen on this planet. It's going to get to the point where we cannot let go of our, our brothers and sisters and the love that we share. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I mean, the, the thing that's so interesting um, that I've discovered in my book was that we are born to give. I mean, you know, we've heard from the evolutionary biologists for a very long time that, um, that you know, we're born to be selfish. And that's the mantra that we hear from the time that we're very young. Uh, but that's not the experience that, and that's certainly not the science anymore. I mean, there's been a lot of evidence to show that that's not true. Um, uh, we've seen, um, for instance, the work of Samuel Oliner. Now, Oliner was, um, he was a young boy um, of 12 during the Second World War. And he was, his, he was Jewish in a Polish town. And one day the Nazis came in and murdered the entire town, including his parents. He was the only survivor. He escaped. He ran through a few, he ran through the woods, he ran through several towns, and he finally made it to the door of someone his parents very distantly knew. Knocks on the door. Balwina answers. She's a Christian. She has a family of two with her husband um, and two children. Nevertheless, she takes him in, and for two years, she hides Samuel from the Nazis. This was a very dangerous thing to do because she could have been informed on by any of her neighbors who would have received a very fat reward for doing so. So he survives, he gets to America, he becomes a noted sociologist, and he says to himself, for many, many years, why on earth did she do this? What would possess anyone to risk her everything, her children, her husband, her own life, to save a relative stranger? So he made a study of it, and he started looking at all of these upstanders, as he calls them, these heroic individuals who, you know, ran up the Twin Towers or dove into icy waters to save people in a plane wreck. You know, we read about them all the time. And what he found is it actually is our natural state. Giving is the natural state of people who have had love in their lives and who are healthy. Selfishness is a sign of pathology. And what it is, is just as you described it, that sense, immediate sense of oneness. People describe over and over that they lose their individuality and they enter into a place of oneness where they just must save that other individual. But we know we're hardwired to have that. It's as hardwired and hardwired to be as pleasurable to give altruistically as to eat or have sex. 
Yeah, and, and I think uh, a, a good example of that is on a cellular level, cells are hardwired, hardwired to be cells too, as individuals. But if you and I were cells in the heart of a, a being, if we could let go of that individuality, that, that uniquely separate cellular part of ourselves, and merge with the consciousness of the being that we inhabit, in this case it would be the planet Earth, and become part of that consciousness, we would look back in dismay at how we were feeling so separate and, and hung on to our cellular identities so strongly. And I, I can feel in myself there's a tendency to let go of so much of my personality and so much of my ego, even though I still use my ego to work my way through the world and deal with certain people. I can, I can see it come out and do its interactions, but I also see that I'm observing that more and more and more. I'm becoming a witness to my own life as I uh, evolve. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you know, we are made to be a cell in a whole, definitely. That is just about everything, you know, in our lives has been created for us to that need to belong that you know we we that's probably our largest need is to belong um, they study suicides and they find that suicides suffer from what they call excessive individuation you know they don't belong they don't feel they fit in and not fitting in is the one thing the major thing they cannot bear um, they have looked at the, I mean, this is a really interesting study. They've looked at uh, areas of America to try to find out which areas have the most suicides. And everybody assumes it's going to be the poorest neighborhoods. And that's true for the very highest number of suicides. But the next si highest number of suicides is not the second poorest neighborhoods, but the richest neighborhoods of America. And what that's all about is the people who commit suicide make slightly less than everyone around them. And in fact, for every 10,000 less you make from your neighbors, your suicide risk goes up 7.5%. Now, what's that all about? Ultimately, that's about belonging, not feeling like you're a financial outcast, the need to connect and fit in. It's a really weird one and, and strange one, but that need is more powerful than anything. Um, that need separates people who are well from those who are sick. Studies have shown that, for instance, with heart disease, only half of all people with heart disease have all the so-called risk factors like high cholesterol. The other half are just simply lonely, and they're dying literally of a broken heart. So they found that loneliness and, or on its head, relationships and connection and community is one of the biggest protectors against um, uh, every kind of illness from uh, from strokes to the common cold illness illness derives mainly from just not connecting and if you connect even with a bad relationship it's better than no relationship um, but the more you people and groups you embrace the more you join the more you're involved all of that is terribly protective can pr even protect you against depression they found that some of the most financially challenged people in America are not depressed as long as they have two things, a strong spiritual sense, but more importantly, a strong spiritual community. So it's the community always that proves incredibly protective in hard times.